Good morning, and thank you for joining the final live cell uh, analysis seminar of 2020. Today, we are going to talk about three broad areas of interest in the field of live cell analysis, namely immune cell killing, cell population identification, and 3D cell models. But firstly, I'd like to introduce the presenters and the team working behind the scenes. So my name is uh, Toon de Roeven. I am the technical sales specialist for the Incosite and IQ in the Benelux. And I'll be hosting today's seminar together with my colleagues, Matt Tomlinson, who is managing our European team of application scientists, and Lynn Thompson, who's the technical sales specialist for the Incosite in North UK and Ireland. If you have any questions about any of the topics presented during today's seminar, please feel free to enter your question in the chat box. And Rebecca Klipstein, one of our field application scientists in the UK, will answer your questions as quickly as possible. In addition, if uh, we also have a special function contained within the chat box, which allows you to organize a follow-up meeting or arrange some time with either our technical sales or field application specialist. So if you would like more information about a certain product, please feel free to request some time with one of the team. And with that, let's start the seminar. As the title of the slide already mentioned, uh, biology happens in real time, yet most of our analyses are still endpoint analyses, resulting in single time point results after, for instance, 24 hours, as you see here, or 48 hours. But the question always remains, what happens between those time points? And more importantly, for instance, during the night. As you can see, without any kinetic data, you're more likely to miss important information on your biology. And this is what the Incusite, with its live cell analysis, solves. So how does it work? First and foremost, the system is actually installed inside the controlled environment of a cell culture incubator, allowing you to assess long-term analysis in stable conditions. The system itself consists of a platform that can hold many different vessels, from flask over petri dishes to most of the standard microbial plates, from six well up to three edible well plates. The Incusite also supports a maximum of six microbial plates at the same time. So what happens inside the Incusite? Now, inside the Incusite, there's a camera that moves around so that the place remains stationary, which is perfect for analyzing suspension cells. And then the camera takes images in HD phase contrast and bright fields for spheroids and organoids. And is also able to assess up to five different fluorescent channels of which maximum uh, three at the same time. So apart from what we've already discussed, what are the key benefits of the Incusite for your research? Well, it all starts with the assay preparation. In most cases, you can simply use the protocol you're currently using with little to no optimization. And if the application is new to you, we offer detailed example protocols for all of the in-house validated applications. And then to further facilitate assay setup, we also provide reagents, which are developed for long-term analysis. Additionally, the system and its software are developed to act as a walkaway system with easy experimental setup and analysis. So no need to write any difficult image, image processing algorithms. Just follow our gather user interface and you'll generate kinetic data like a pro. And all the images acquired by the system can be visually checked, be it individually or uh, in a bird's view by zooming in and out on the plate or flask. And this can be done during or after the experiment and from any computer connected to the same network as the Incusite. And having that remote connection is a key benefit now in times of social distancing, right? Currently, our Incusite portfolio consists of three Incusite systems. The Incusite SX1, the Incusite S3, and the Incusite SX5 which enables us actually to offer an Incusite to every lab and for every circumstances. Let me start with the Incusite SX1. The Incusite SX1 is actually our entry level Incusite, offering the ability to analyze two plates at the same time. It is equipped based on the configuration with the same optics as the Incusite S3, and it can therefore be upgraded to an Incusite S3 at any time. It also supports almost all of the applications one can do with uh, all of the other Incusite systems. The Incusite S3 is actually our standard 
for high throughput lifestyle analysis with the ability to analyze up to six plates at the same time with two fluorescent colors. And then the latest member of the Incusite family is our Incusite SX5. And this is our most versatile Incusite with space for, again, six plates at the same time, but with also more fluorescent colors to accommodate more multiplexing, more complex cell culture models, and more applications like our, like our new range of metabolism assays. And I now would like to hand over the presentation to my colleague, Matt Tomlinson, who will tell you more about a certain number of applications. Thank you, Tom. And I just want to start by saying this is the list of applications for which we have validated assays and protocols, and in some cases, reagents. And if there's something that I don't mention today, please get in touch with us. Our technical sales specialists will be more than happy to talk to you about the different applications and potentially our field application scientists as well. So today, I'm going to start by talking about a slightly older application, uh, which is apoptosis, but with a, a new twist. So apoptosis is an assay that we've run on the Incusite for a, a large number of years. However, we can now use our new cell-by-cell -cell analysis module to get even more information into this dynamic process. So in this assay, we have HT1080 fibrosarcoma cells. These have been transduced to express a red nuclear protein, and they've been cultured in the presence of a caspase 3 sensitive dye, which is then going to give us a read when the cells begin to undergo apoptosis. The cells have been treated with either a vehicle control or camptothecin, and we can see at 30 hours, the vehicle control, the cells look very nice and healthy, they've proliferated, they've formed a confluent layer, whereas the camptothecin treated cells are now looking very different. We see green fluorescence as they're beginning to undergo apoptosis, we see this granulation, we see cytoplasmic swellings. So we can perform cell-by-cell -cell segmentation on these objects and we can get cell count information from this. However, we can also get additional information on a per cell basis. So we can measure the size and the shape of these objects, but we can also get information about the fluorescence intensity inside each cell. So if we look at the vehicle control, we see the vast majority of cells sit inside this red viable quadrant. So the, this, these dot plots, which are very similar to flow cytometry data, have all been acquired through imaging, but imaging on a kinetic basis. So we can get kinetic dot plots from within these assays. We see with the vehicle control, there aren't many cells which exhibit a red and green uh, phenotype, and we have very few that are apoptotic. So the vast majority of cells in this assay are healthy. However, if we then look at the camptothecin treated, we see something quite different. So with our quadrant gating that we've applied, we can see that, the va that we have some cells that are still uh, red and fluorescent. They, these cells are our viable cells, as this is a transduced signal. Only viable cells will still um, ex exhibit the red signal. When the cells are beginning to die or undergoing early apoptosis, there's still some red signal present, but the cells are now also presenting this green caspase 3.7 uh, positive phenotype. So these are our early apoptotic cells, and then we see them moving into this green only quadrant, which would be late apoptosis. We can then plot this information, and we can see how these different populations change over time. So we can see the viable population with the vehicle control remains relatively consistent. However, when we look at camptothecin treated, we see something quite different. We see a loss of viability over time, and then we see a rise early on in the assay at around six or eight hours, of early apoptosis, so this red and green phenotype, and then we see a, late, a rise in late apoptosis at around 14 or 16 hours. It's then possible to look at these different populations when we're considering drug treatments. So here we have a concentration range of camptothecin, and we can see how this viable population changes with increasing concentrations of camptothecin, and we see that loss of viability. Conversely, we see a rise in early apoptosis with a, a large number of uh, concentrations of camptothecin, and then we see how those change over the course of the assay. And the thing to make note of here is, as I say, these have all been acquired through imaging in a kinetic basis. So this gives advantages over traditional flow cytometry-based approaches because we're using the same sample on a repeating basis. To obtain this information with flow cytometry, typically you would have to use a fresh sample 
each time you wanted to run this assay, and potentially these would be at difficult to obtain time points in the middle of the night. Of course, for the Inky site, that makes no difference whatsoever. So I'm now going to run through this. It's effectively the same assay, but I want to focus on a couple of different things here. So these are Jercat um, T cells that have again been transduced to express a red nuclear construct treated with camptothecin in the presence of a green caspase 37 sensitive dye. What I want to draw your attention to is this movie over this side. So these red, orange and green uh, dots are actually masks that have been applied to the cells and they correspond to when a cell is in a particular quadrant. So one of these dots here will correspond to one of these cells here. And we can see over time how that population changes because the masking will change. We can also see it change on the dot plots and the histograms, and we'll be able to see how that population proportion changes during the course of the assay as well. So we can see quite early on in this assay, the cells lose viability, they move into the early apoptotic region, and then later on, around two days into the assay, the majority of cells then sit in that green only um, post-apoptotic quadrant. So I'm now going to talk about a live cell immunocytochemistry application. And I mentioned this because in some later slides, I'll talk about uh, labeling of, of cells. So with this assay here, we're looking at cell surface marker expression over time or subpopulation determination. And for this, we utilize an IgG FC portion binding green dye. So this is really designed for monoclonal antibodies. Here we have an anti-CD8 antibody that's been labeled with our FabFlor 488 dye, and these cells have then been cultured in the presence of a A549 tumor cells, which have been labeled with a cytoplasmate dye. So here we're looking really specifically at the cytotoxic T cells. And we can see swarming of the cells, and we can actually see an immune cell binding to a tumor cell. And if we zoom into that particular region, we can actually see there the formation of an immunological synapse on the cell, for the cell. Here we have anti-CD45 labeled with, uh, with FabFlor 488. So here we're labeling the hematopoietic cells. So we can see these green objects are, are our hematopoietic cells. And then we've compared that to an IgG isotype control and we see no meaningful signal. We can then plot this and we can see those two different populations. We can see our CD45 positives and we can see that with the isotype control, we're not getting much in the way of meaningful signal. So I'm now going to spend the next few slides looking at immune cell killing. So immune cell killing is an assay which we have invested quite a lot of time in over the last few years. And I'm gonna talk about a few different options for immune cell killing based approaches. So I'll start with probably the most straightforward of setups. This is an adherent cell killing assay. These are SCOV3 ovarian cancer cells, and they've been cultured in the presence of caspase 37 green with both non-activated and activated PBMCs. If we play out the movie, we can see the SCOV3s with the non-activated PBMCs. The PBMCs seem to tolerate the tumor cells. The tumor cells proliferate, we see cell division, and the cells approach confluency. However, if we then culture them with activated PBMCs, we see something quite different. We see granulation of the cells, we see cytoplasmic swellings, we see swarming, and we see green fluorescence as those tumor cells are being killed by the immune cells. It's then possible to plot this data. And here we can see our green object count on this side. So this is looking specifically at cell death. So here with the activated PBMCs, we see a very strong response. This is activation with anti-CD3 and IL-2. And then we're also looking at a concentration gradient of Herceptin going from the bottom to top of the highest concentration, seemingly giving the highest extent of killing. We can then also look at the red object count by having that red transduced nuclear marker, we can use that as a, as a measure of viability because as I say, if the cell will start to die, it will cease to produce that protein. So we can use that to determine cell viability. Here, 
we see in the vehicle control, we have proliferation of the SCOV3s, and then with increasing Herceptin concentration, we see a decreasing viability of those tumour cells. And the nice thing about being able to run this assay in an imaging manner is that we're able to continuously image those cells, but we don't have to perform any further manipulations of them. So we can get the data from the image without having to enzymatically treat the cells, take them to, for example, a flow cytometer to perform any downstream analysis. So I'm also going to now talk about adherent immune cell killing, but in this time with a three color analysis. So this is specific to the new Incusite SX5. In this assay, we have A549 cells. These have been transduced to express an NIR signal within the nucleus. This appears blue in the image. We've pseudo-colored the NIR to blue, the reason being that visually NIR and orange are quite close, so the human eye doesn't have the best ability to, to distinguish those two colors. The incusite, of course, can distinguish them very easily, but for visualization purposes, we've colored the NIR to blue. Here, the cells have been co-cultured with human PBMCs. These have been labeled with an anti-CD45 antibody that's been labeled with our FabFlor488 reagent. So we see these green dots, these are our PBMCs. And then we have an annexin 5 orange cell death reporter. If we culture the cells with non-activated PBMCs, we see a strongly proliferative response from the A549s. We see them approaching confluency. We don't see much in the way of killing. Compare that to activated PBMCs, we don't see the same extent of proliferation of the A549s, but we do see a strongly proliferative response from the CD45 positive PBMCs, and we see that cell killing response. So the advantage here of having that third color really gives a lot more information about this assay because we can specifically look at the CD45s, for example, compared to the target cells. We can then plot this data out and we can look at activated versus non-activated PBMC. So we can see that with, with non-activated, we see a proliferative response from the A549s. And then when we have increasing affected to target ratios, we see a decrease in the proliferative response of the A549s. Conversely, when we look at effector cell proliferation, we don't see any proliferation when the PBMCs are non-activated, but we see a strong proliferative response when we're looking at activated PBMCs at the highest effector to target ratio. We can then determine apoptosis and the extent of killing, and we can see that the three different effector to target ratios, we see differing degrees of cell killing, and we can also get timing information from this. So we can see at what point that immune cell killing assay started to occur. So we can see that was just short of 48 hours into the assay, we start to see this increase in cell killing. We can assess effector cell subpopulations utilizing the cell by cell analysis mode specifically for the non-adherent cells. And we can see how CD45 proportions change during the course of the assay. And we can see with activated PBMCs, it remains relatively consistent. However, when we have non-activated PBMCs, we actually see a drop off in CD45 proportion of PBMCs within this culture. So I'm now going to show some data that was uh, given to us by a customer. This data is courtesy of Professor Michael O'Dwyer at the National University of Ireland in Galway. And these are pancreatic uh, cancer cells that have been cultured in the presence of NK cells. So what we can see here is the pancreatic tumor cell here with the NK cells around. And what we're able to see is those NK cells engage with that tumor cell. And we can see eventually that cell start to round up and then Later on, we can then see that green fluorescent signal come up as that uh, pancreatic cancer cell is being killed by the NK cells. So whilst, of course, the, the, we can get that quantification of this process, we can also get a very good, very good qualitative information showing that we have engagement of our tumor cells with our immune cells. Now, in this assay, these cells were actually labeled with um, a cytolite rapid dye, so we had a red label in there, and I've chosen not to include that for now. But what we were able to look at was overlap analysis, and this is the coincidence between two different fluorescent objects in the X and Y plane. So this really is able to, allows us to show specifically target cell death. However, when we looked at the initial overlap analysis, 
we didn't see much in the way of genuine signal. The red, blue, and green correspond to three different affected to target ratios. In fact, the green was the highest affected to target ratio. So initially we were a little disappointed that this assay didn't yield any, any difference. However, we then looked a bit more into the data and we saw that the initial cell seeding of the target cells was quite variable throughout the culture. So this histogram corresponds to the different cell seeding concentrations in each well. We then utilize the Incusite's normalization function within the graphing software, and we were able to actually then tease apart the difference between the uh, different effector to target ratios. And we could see that at the highest effector to target ratio, we saw that there was actually a difference between that, that range compared to the, uh, the two lower effector to target ratios. So by having that live cell imaging assay and using image, images as raw data allowed us to look back and really understand what was happening in our assay and allowed us to then perform that normalization step. So I'm now going to look at a non-adherent immune cell killing assay. And now it's, it's a common misconception of suspension cells that they are free floating within a well. This isn't the case. This is typically a function of us moving the, the plate from the incubator to the microscope stage to then look at our cells. But if you, you, if you leave your non-adherent cells in the incubator or in the incusite, they will typically float to the bottom of the well and sediment there, and then will remain in a consistent focal plane for through the course of the assay. In this particular example, we have Ramos B cells as our target cell type. These are culture with both non-activated and activated PBMCs in the presence of an Exon5 green. We can see with the non-activated PBMCs, we get a proliferative response from the Ramos cells. However, with activated PBMCs, we see proliferation of the PBMCs themselves, we see swarming of the Ramos cells, and we see green fluorescent signal as the cells are beginning to die. We can also see some morphological change as well. We can see that with the non-activated PBMCs, they mostly exhibit this rounded, small morphology. Whereas when they're activated, we actually see them change. They elongate and they swell in size as well. And we can quantify this with the cell-by-cell -cell module. Speaking of cell-by-cell, -cell, we can gate and segment the different cells here. So here we have our red positive target cell quadrant. Here we have our red negative immune cell quadrant, and then we can look at apoptosis specifically within these different populations. So we can assess effector and target cell death specifically. When we look at the different effector to target ratios and activated PBMCs, much like with the adherent cells, we see that the, the non-activated PBMCs, we see increase in target cell proliferation, whereas we don't see the same effect when we're looking at activated PBMCs. We can look specifically at target cell death, as I mentioned, by utilizing the cell-by-cell -cell analysis module, and this allows us to perform an apoptotic index analysis as well. And here we can see at the highest effect to target ratio, we have the highest degree of killing. Again, we can look at immune cell proliferation using the cell-by-cell -cell module, and here we can see that, as you would expect, as there are more PBMCs in this well, we have the highest degree of proliferation with those activated PBMCs. So I'm now going to walk you through how we would look to analyze a three color immune cell killing data set. In this assay, we're using Ramos cells as our target cell type. These are transduced to express an orange protein in their nucleus. These are cultured with PBMCs, act activated PBMCs and non-activated. These have been either labeled with an anti-CD8 Fab4488 dye to look at specifically the cytotoxic T cells or an IgG isotype control. And then we've added an annexin 5 NIR cell death marker. So this is our vessel view. So when an assay has run, we can see the vessels here. We can open up this experiment. Here we can see our different cell types. We can see our red or orange, sorry, Ramos cells. We can see our green um, CD8 T cells, and we can see our and next in 5 NAR, again, pseudo-colored to blue. So to launch the analysis, we move over to this graph from COG icon. This will open up a guided interface that will walk the user through how to run their analysis. We're gonna create a new analysis here. Now we have a choice here as whether to use the basic analyzer 
or the non-adherent cell-by-cell analysis mode. For now, we'll choose the basic analyzer. We can then choose the image channels in which we're interested. So we're going to deselect the phase for this analysis, but I'm also going to turn, o turn on overlap analysis. Now, overlap is a way, as I mentioned before, of assessing coincident objects. So looking at where green and orange objects intersect, orange and NIR, green and NIR, for example. Now, the first thing we need to do when running an analysis is to provide the InkySight with a representative series of, uh, of images throughout the course of the assay that allows the software to perform an initial analysis and then we can then go in and make some refinements. So we choose an, an early time point and we choose later time points and we look at different treatments as well. So we can look at positive controls and negative controls. And the idea being here that if we can mask these ends of the assay, all points in between should be analyzable as well. So the first thing we would always do is preview current. This gives the InkySight software the ability to train on the mass, on the, uh, the, the images that we've given it. So the first thing we need to do is look at our background subtraction and segmentation. I'm going to drop the radius of this down to 10. These are small PBMCs in the green, so I'm decreasing my radius. I'm also looking at the fluorescence intensity here. So if you hover over any object, it will give information about that pixel. So here it's telling me that my green is a little bit dimmer than two. So I'm just gonna drop my threshold down here to 0.8. I'm gonna toggle off my edge split. Edge split is a way of fragmenting a fluorescent signal, which is I deal if a, uh, a dye is nuclear, but here we have a cell surface dye, so I'm going to toggle the edge split off. And I'm now just going to turn off the auto scale that's being applied. I'm just going to increase the minimum value just to cut away any fluorescence which is below our threshold value, just from a visualization standpoint. And you can see which objects are now being detected by that green masking. Now we're going to look at the orange and the uh, NIR. So the orange is labelled with yellow. So we're looking at the orange signal intensity there of each object. So we have eight, we have 6.1. So again, I'm going to go in, I'm going to reduce my radius. I'm going to bring that down to 10 again. I'm going to leave my threshold value set at two. Keep the edge split on as it's a nuclear object. And then I'm going to look at the NIR. So I'm going to hover over an object, we see the NIR values, that's quite large at 108, and then this is 6.9, and here we have 1.9. So there's some, a little bit of variability in the intensity of that labeling. So for that reason, again, radius is gonna come down, again, small objects, I'll keep my threshold at two, and I'm gonna turn the edge split off again, because this is a, a, a cell surface marker. So I can now toggle off the different channels, should I wish to, and I can also toggle off the different masks. So we see here, specifically the Ramos cells, here looking at an XN5, so a marker of apoptosis or necrosis. And then I'm gonna go to a late time point, and I'm going to preview the masking that I've applied onto the first image to all images in my collection. And what I'm really looking for here is whether my masking fits. Does it make sense? So I'm gonna to toggle off the, uh, the green masking. And we can see here what's being detected by that green mask. Similarly with the orange and also the NIR as well. So at this stage, I'm happy with that analysis. So I'm now gonna click next. I'm gonna select the, the time points of interest, the wells of interest. I'm gonna give this a name. I need to be clear with my naming because users can share different analysis definitions should they wish. And this is a significant advantage because it reduces variability. If everyone is using the same parameters, any difference is then biological, not necessarily software. So now my data is analyzed. I'm going to open up that analyzed data set so we can see the masking that's being applied based upon the parameters that I've selected. And I can now look to export the data from this. So I open up the graphing software. I can make my own metrics should I wish. I can also use the predefined metrics. 
So I, here I'm choosing total green count per image. And what we can see is when we look at it on a well by well basis, we see our CD8 populations and how they change. So here we have activated, non-activated, and then we have IgG isotype controls. So that's exactly as we would expect. The CD8s proliferate when they're activated, not when they are uh, non-activated. Now we're looking at Ramos cell count. So the top two, or sorry, the top row, we're seeing cell death of the Ramos cells. The bottom row, we're seeing proliferation of the Ramos cells. Again, that's what we would expect. We have activated versus non-activated PBMCs. And then we look at the Annexin 5 signal and we see the opposite. We see cell death with activated PBMCs and we see no cell death with the non-activated PBMCs. Now, we could also aggregate this data together. We have replicates, so we could go to the graphing function and use those replicates. We could look at overlap as well, and we can also export that data for third-party analysis in packages such as Excel and Prism. I'm now going to perform a cell by cell analysis. So we've already performed the classification of the cells. So here we're excluding those smaller objects. We're only picking up the larger events. We're going to perform a subclassification here. And now instead of choosing a particular series of images, what we're actually going to choose is a particular treatment group. So we're going to make a new definition. So I'm going to choose my, my wells of interest based upon the uh, the plate map so here we have our igg isotype control with our non-activated pbmcs i'm going to choose my metric so i'm going to look at orange which is going to be my ramos cells nir this is going to be my annexin 5 i click next and then i can see my two different populations and how they're separated i can man manually adjust those slide bars to look at the quadrant gating or i can input a value here I'll choose 0.8 and I'll keep my NIR at 0.26. And then we can see how those different populations change over time. So we can see on the bottom right hand corner, we can see how those proportions change during the course of this assay. We see now we've got 20% of the cells in the assay of Ramos, now 28%. So we can see that proliferative response based upon um, the quadrant gating that we've applied. Now I'm going to deselect my non-activated and look specifically at the activated PBMCs and we'll see how the Ramos cells change when they're cultured with the, with the activated PBMCs. So we'll keep our gating the same as we've previously defined and now we'll look through that at different time points. So we can see here we have our apoptotic cells in the upper uh, two quadrants, non-apoptotic below. And we can see that Ramos cell population shift up and into this higher uh, double positive quadrant. Can then select the wells and times of interest that I want to analyze using my um, using my subpopulation classification. I'm going to input the values. We'll base this on the uh, the threshold values that we've selected: 0.8, 0.26, and then I'll click finish, and then this would run my analysis. I'm going to open up a slightly different analysis, but we can see now, if we look at this pink object and this blue object, pink corresponds to our double positives, our Ramos apoptotic cells, and blue corresponds to our Ramos healthy cells. And what we can see is how these different populations change over the course of the assay. We see the pink starts to diminish, sorry, increase, sorry, and the blue starts to diminish as those cells are being killed by the PBMCs. So that was just a very quick run through of how we would perform one of these analyses. But I think what it shows is how quick and simple it is to use the Incusite software to analyze what is quite a, a complex data set. So I'm now going to move on to a slightly different topic and I'm going to talk about some 3D assays. I'm going to start with a tumor spheroid assay. So this is a, a relatively simplistic setup. Here we would have an ultra low attachment round bottom plate. We would seed our cells to this, allow a spheroid to form, add any treatments potentially, and then begin imaging. Now in this example here, we have a 384 well plate. 96 well plates are also amenable. We have three different cell types at four different seeding densities. And what we can see is the consistency here of the focus 
and also the analysis that's applied of these objects. And for this, we use Brightfield imaging. Brightfield is, is much better designed for imaging three-dimensional objects because there is already contrast there. Face contrast works brilliantly for flat structures where contrast needs to be added, but when you already have contrast, Brightfield gives a more consistent uh, approach. I'm going to zoom in on one particular example here. Here we have SCOV3 cells. These are treated, treated with camptothecin or untreated. So you can see on the left hand side we see proliferation and growth of that spheroid, whereas when we have camptothecin treatment what we see is something quite different. The spheroid doesn't really change in size but morphologically we can see that there is a, a clear difference there with camptothecin treatment. We can then plot that bright field object area and we can see that our control increases quite nicely whereas our drug treated remains relatively consistent in size. To obtain some additional information from this, we would like to look at cytotoxicity. So for this, we're using our cytotox green dye. This binds to exposed double-stranded DNA. So as the nuclear membrane is permeabilized, the dye will be able to cross and bind to the DNA. In the untreated control, we see some green fluorescence. We see some autofluorescence as well. But in the camptothecin treated, we see a very strong green response as those cells are being killed by the drug. This can then be plotted out and we can see that the control increases a little bit, but we see a very strong increase in the drug treated sample. We can also use our nucleite transduction, as I mentioned previously, as a, as a marker of viability. So here we can see the untreated increase in size and intensity, whereas the camptothecin treated, we see a very strong drop off in the signal intensity as those cells are being killed by the camptothecin and we can plot this as well and we see quite clearly there is a loss of viability following drug treatment. Now again I'm going to show some customer generated data. This is courtesy of Dr Simona Bramanti at the University of Helsinki and these were myometrial cells that were cultured for just shy of 13 days. And what we can see is actually those cells condense. But the thing I want to draw your attention to here is the consistency of the focus during the course of what is nearly two weeks of imaging. And also the masking as well is very, very specific to that spheroid. And this is the advantage of using bright field uh, imaging and analysis for 3D spheroids. So I'm just going to take a little step back and just bring in the immune cell killing assay about which I mentioned earlier. And here we're looking at immune cell killing of tumor spheroids. So here we have A549 cells. These are again are transduced to express a red nuclear signal. Uh, but they're cultured with non-activated and activated PBMCs. And with the non-activated, we see that spheroid signal remain relatively consistent. However, when we look at activated PBMCs, we see a drop off in terms of the signal intensity, much like we did previously with the drug treated. The key difference here though is that we're including uh, activated PBMCs and they are inducing the killing. And then we can plot this data out and we can see that drop off in terms of the signal intensity. And really the advantage to this running this assay on the Yinky site is the throughput that you can obtain. In theory, this could be run in three at four wheel plates, and we could have six three at four wheel plates being run in parallel. So there'd be over 2,300 separate data points acquired every three or four hours, which is very high throughput in the context of 3D biology. So to round off what I'm talking about with single spheroids, I'm going to go to our new spheroid invasion analysis mode. And this is part of the existing spheroid module and the idea here is that we're looking at the metastatic potential of tumor cells so here we have u87 mg cells this this is a glioblastoma cell line we have this the bright field image we can see that invasive phenotype we can see this philopodia coming out of that spheroid we have our whole spheroid mask this is capturing everything that's detectable in the bright field and then we have our invading cell mask and effectively here, what we're doing is taking our whole spheroid mask and then subtracting away that central spheroid core, leaving us with just the invading cell mask. In this example movie here, we have U87 cells again, and we're looking here at the metastatic potential. Here, the cells have been embedded in 4.5 uh, mg per mil 
of matrigel. This is the spheroid has been allowed to form. The matrigel has then been added to the well, and we see the control proliferate and invade quite considerably. However, when these cells are treated with cytochalasin D, which is a cell cycle inhibitor arresting the cells in the G1S phase, we don't see anything like the same invasive phenotype. We can then plot this out and we can look at the look at different cell types. So here we have U87MGs, A172s and HT1080s. We see the U87MGs will grow quite considerably, have a very large invading cell mask. However, the A172s are much smaller, not quite so invasive, and similarly with the HT1080s. And as I say, we can plot this information out. So we can look at the difference in the size of the whole spheroid mask. We can see that the U87s are the largest, then the HT1080s, and then the A172s. When we then specifically look at the invading cell mask, however, what we see is that actually the HT1080s and the A172s have a relatively similar invasive uh, potential. And the reason that the, the HT1080s were slightly, well, had a slightly higher whole spheroid size is just because the starting spheroid was that bit bigger. So I'm going to present some uh, some customer generated data here. This is uh, courtesy of Pamela Collier and Professor Anna Grabowska at the University of Nottingham in the UK. And we can see here an example of a tumor spheroid. Now these are tumor cells that have, have an M cherry transduction and they're cultured with a fibroblastic cell type, which is GFP. So we have no masking. We have the M cherry masking here and then we have the GFP masking in the pink. And over the course of this assay, we can see that spheroid start to grow in size. We can actually see it remodeling the matrix around itself. You can see some invasion happening as well. We can see that blue that's overlaying the red start to increase in its intensity. And we actually see that green signal start to diminish a little bit during the course of this, uh, this seven day assay. We then plot this information out. Now, what we have here are different co-culture examples. So we were looking at different species of tumor cell and fibroblastic cell. And at the top, we have fibroblasts co-cultured with, a, so human fibroblasts co-cultured with tumor cell. And then we have mouse and other species, and we also have tumor cells alone. So what this data showed us is that the human fibroblastic cells were providing a supportive framework for those tumor cells to then grow and increase in their size whereas that wasn't the same when we were looking at different species of, uh, of fibroblastic cells so when we're discussing these assays to now we've looked at single spheroids now of course we are mindful that single spheroids doesn't cover the full range of three-dimensional assays and for that reason we've developed additional assays and imaging modes so here we have a multispheroid imaging and analysis mode this is designed to look at multispheroids being formed in a flat 96 well plate format with a matrix layer such as matrigel in this assay we would coat our plate add some cells reagents potentially monitor spheroid formation and then add any treatments in this example here we can see a vehicle control versus camp to thesis treated these are a549 cells and we can see when the vehicle control this the multispheroids are much larger we can see the nuclear red signal in each cell increases in the vehicle control but diminishes with camp to thesis treatment and then we can see an x in five green going up a little bit with the vehicle control but considerably with camp to thesis treatment and this is a, a an example movie here we have md mda mb231 cells these have got a nucleite transduction but for now we're just showing the bright field image here we have the vehicle control versus camp to thesis treated what we can see is that both cell types actually do or both treatments do increase in their their size over time although the camp to thesis seem to stall at a particular point now if we were to just assess bright field imaging there we might not get as much information from that assay however by utilizing the nuclear transduction and assessing viability what we can see is that the vehicle control 
increases in size and inc also increases in red fluorescence intensity. Conversely, the camptothecin treated, we don't see that same increase in intensity and actually we do see a drop off in signal intensity. So it's clear that these multispheroids are being killed by the drug treatment. We can plot this data out and we can see that in the red we have our drug treated. We see that that remains at a consistent level. The untreated increases and then, and then remains relatively static. However, then looking at the red fluorescent signal, we see something quite different. We see the drug, the, the control increases and, and then plateaus again, but we can see the drug treated increases, gets to a certain point, and then as killing uh, commences, we see that drop off in red signal intensity. And this is the final piece of, uh, of data generated by, by customers. Again, this is from uh, Pamela and Professor Grabowska at the University of Nottingham. And these are these are stem cells that have been cultured to a, to a matrix layer. And what I want to draw your attention to really here is the self-organization that occurs uh, very rapidly in this assay. They're plated out as single cells. These also have a GFP uh, construct uh, added to them. And we can see very, very quickly, within a few hours, those cells have gone from single cells and are very rapidly formed into a spheroid structure. And they begin to undergo matrix remodeling. And then we see we see them start to proliferate out slightly as well. So the final 3D assay that I'd like to talk about is our new organoid culture QC imaging and analysis module. And this is really designed for the assessment of the development of organoids in matrigel domes. In this assay, we would have our uh, or organoid progenitor cells that have been uh, added to the, the matrix. The matrix is then pipetted into a 48 or 24 well plate. The matrix is allowed to polymerize at 37 degrees to form this dome structure. This is then overlaid with medium and we can then assess and monitor organoid formation and growth. In this example here, we have mouse intestinal organoids and mouse pancreatic organoids. You can see the edge here of this dome structure. And what we can see is these organoids increasing in their size, also increasing in their complexity and forming those crypt structures over about eight days. When we look at the mouse pancreatic organoids, they have a slightly more regular structure, they're slightly more rounded, and they increase in, in size considerably faster. We plot this information and get information on the object size. We can see that the intestinal organoids increase at a relatively consistent rate over the course of about eight days. Whereas when we're looking at the pancreatic organoids, they increase very quickly in their size and then plateau out. We can get additional information though from this, this imaging mode and this analysis mode. So here we have mouse hepatic organoids at day zero, day four and day six. We can look at the total area in the uh, in the dome. So we can see that at three, sorry, four different seeding densities. We can see the increase in the total area over time. When we look at the eccentricity, this is a measure of the circularity of the uh, of the object. So a value of zero would be a perfect circle. A value of one would be a straight line. What we see is that they have a relatively middling eccentricity, just shy of 0.5. And we see that that remains relatively consistent throughout the course of the entire assay. We can also get information about the darkness of the object. Now, the darkness is a measure of the comp complexity or the maturation of the different organoids. And what we can see up here is that some of these organoids are much darker than some of the others. So they're undergoing further maturation. And we can see at the highest seeding, seeding density, we have the highest degree of darkness or maturation within these organoids. And so the last assay that I just want to quickly mention, I mention it because it's an, it's an older imaging mode that we've had for the Incusite for a, a number of years, but it's now much more applicable when we talk about the context of the S3 and the SX5. And this is our dilution cloning imaging mode. It's a, way, it's a way of assessing colony formation. So this uses the 4X objective, which was more challenging on older systems. Um, whereas with the automated turret of the S3 and the SX5, it's much more applicable. So here we are 
using the Incusite to image one single cell in a well. So we're, rather than focusing on the cells, we're focusing on the plastic in these assays. So we would seed our cells, potentially transfect, although that's not essential. We can then identify colony formation over time. But because we've been imaging this colony from the moment it was put in the Incusite, we can then go back in time and confirm whether or not that colony was derived from one single cell. And in this example here, we have MDA MB231 cells. We can see a colony that's formed. We're now winding the clock back to the beginning of this assay. And we're looking to see whether we can confirm that this is a clonal population. And indeed we can. We can now see that that is now one single cell. So we have a clonally derived population. And with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Lynn Thompson. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I'm just going to quickly summarize what uh, what Matt's gone through today. Um, we went through a few examples of lifestyle imaging and analysis with the Incusite system. We had a look at the subpopulation identification with both adherent and non-adherent cells using our caspase reagents. We went through a few examples of lifestyle imaging and analysis. Um, we explored how the Incusite can acquire three color images and then we can further analyze them using the software. We reviewed immune cell mediated killing and had a more in-depth look at the spheroid and organoid formation and development methods. You can, thank you. Um, so as you have seen, the Incusite is available in three different versions, the SX1, the S3, and the SX5. And we have a variety of different software modules available to suit your lab's research and throughput requirements. So based on what you're working on, there's uh, an available solution for everybody. We do currently have some promotions running at the moment from now until the end of the year. So if this is anything you'd like to find out some more about, if you can just pop your information into the chat box and the relevant rep will get back to you with uh, some more information on that for you. And then finally, we just wanted to let you know a little bit more about our reagents and consumables that were discussed throughout the webcast. Um, our reagents are specifically designed and optimized for long-term live cell analysis without harming your cells. Uh, we have redesigned our website a little bit to make it a bit more user-friendly for yourselves to be able to see pricing and see what's available. We have this add to quote function, so you can essentially build up uh, your list of reagents that you're looking for. If you fill out your information on the form, it will then be sent to your local uh, technical sales representative who can get back to you with a quote and some pricing. Um, and once again, if you have any further questions about any of that information, if you just pop your information into the chat box, we can get back to you with that. Uh, for everybody who's attended the webinar today, we are offering four for three on all of our reagents. So if this is an offer you'd like to receive, um, just pop your information into the chat box, let us know what you're interested in, or basically if you just want to see the catalog of reagents and we'll put together some quotes for you. Um, and additionally, I think at the very beginning it was mentioned that you can arrange via the link in the chat a meeting with your local FAS if you want to have a more technical discussion about what you're working on, um, just use that link function available to you in the chat box. Uh, we do hope that you found the webcast useful. I always find, uh, I always learn things when I attend these, um, you know, with customers and on the web like this. So I hope you guys find it useful as well. I think that there was a question that came up throughout the presentation that Rebecca would like to um, ask to the group or present to the group. So before we say goodbye, I'm just going to pass it over to Rebecca, but we all will be hanging around for a few more minutes. If anyone has any questions at all, um, just get in touch. Thank you, Lynn. Can everyone hear me? Yes, you're all good. Yes, perfect. Okay, so um, we had quite a few questions regarding the cell-by-cell -cell classification we showed at the beginning of the webinar. So one of the questions was if the subpopulation studies are only available for the SX5 or if it was also available for the Incusite S3. 
And the answer is that yes, it is available for both S3 and SX5. So if you're interested in um, getting the software module, you can contact your technical specialist. Then also uh, another question regarding the cell by cell was if it's a specific software or if it comes with the standard InQsight. So yes, this is an additional software module, <clears throat> excuse me. And if you would like to purchase, you can get in touch again with your local sales specialist. And a last question was if this software can be used with adherent cells only, or if they can also use suspension cells. And the answer is yes, you can use it with both cell types, adherent and non-adherent. We have examples on our website and we showed some examples on the webinar. So if you also need more information on how to set up these assays, you can contact your field application scientist. Thank you very much.